Thanks very much for being here once again. Um, my name is Vidya Alex and I'm the Director of Research at the Resolution Foundation. And I'm going to talk you through um, this latest analysis that we'll be publishing shortly. So when most people talk about social mobility, what they're generally talking about is the link between an individual's income and their parents' income. So mobility between generations. And that's been well researched by Steve Machen and Paul Gregg and Joe Blandon, amongst others. And it's also been well addressed and addressed in detail by policy. So for example, the recent government social mobility strategy. But as Gavin said, there's another kind of mobility which we're also very concerned about, which is the ability for people to work their way up the earnings ladder and improve their living standards during their own lifetime. So, and for most of the people on low to middle incomes, they're actually nearer the bottom end of the earnings distribution. So while some of those households will have benefited from some of that increase in mobility, not all of them, a lot of them won't have done. And one of the reasons why they don't, one of the reasons why they're in the bottom half of the earnings distribution is that they don't actually have, in many cases, a lot of those characteristics that we've just discussed that are important to mobility. So only 16% of them have a degree, and we've just seen that you know, degrees lead to greater upper mobility. They're much more likely to work part-time than higher earners, and very few of them are in professional occupations. So as a group, they lack a lot of the characteristics that <coughs> make them much more likely to move on, and that's a particular concern to us. First of all, um, there is enormous potential in education and training to help improve intragenerational mobility, help improve life chances of adults. Uh, but our own evidence very much confirms what you heard already this evening, that at the moment the opportunities, the training and education opportunities, tend to go to the people who've already enjoyed training and education. They tend to reinforce the advantages that we see more and more apprenticeships going to people who are in work and are seeking extra training and opportunities. And I think, for example, of the conversation I had uh, with a woman who had been working on the tills at Tesco's. Tesco's had got into and um, uh, committed themselves to um, launching an apprenticeship scheme until recently they didn't have one, had been uh, looking around their current staff of people who could benefit from the apprenticeship scheme. And in the store I visited, she was the apprentice. She was probably in her 40s. She'd been working on the tills. Her children had got a bit older. And they, she'd been assessed as someone who really had got the potential to move up the management structure of Tesco's and was joining the apprenticeship. And we... So social mobility is very, very important. Um, the problem, I think, um, with as it were, placing it on the platform of being the overriding social policy objective, which is what the government strategy earlier this year uh, said, is that it then uh, takes its place above other objectives that you might also care about if you seriously can commit yourself to pursuing it at the expense of other things, and, or at least uh, ahead of other things. And uh, in the government strategy, the first assertion that you read is that fairness is social mobility. So a wider understanding of fairness, particularly fairness of outcomes, income and wealth in particular, but other kinds of ways that we can think about fairness, procedural fairness, how we allocate uh, resources in public services and so on, uh, are subordinate or, if you like, sidelined because fairness has become social mobility. What we've got in terms of the primary access to higher education is a a growing gap where female participation is significantly higher than male participation. That is a statement of fact. It's not a bad thing when we have this. But the, uh, so I, I think we are in a transitional state where if we accept the arguments we just see about the opportunities provided by a university degree, uh, it does look as if we are entering a situation where down the track we can see more and more of those advantages proportionately. Uh, for women rather than men. It's not a bad thing that women, I have to try this out before you send it, it's not a bad thing that women have those opportunities, but I did think we then, we, when you look at the figures, it's something like 46% participation in HE for women, 36, 37% for men. It was quite a significant gap, and that I think is also a legitimate kind of policy issue. 